he is reigning in the heavens. He's in full control of what's taking place, what's going to take place. And uh, it's just good to be able to acknowledge him. And, and we had an incident yesterday with family. And, you know, it was a, kind of one of those numbing instances, I guess you could say, or experiences. But uh, every time <clears throat> every time that happens, it just, it just brings me back to that spirit of gratitude that I'm glad I know what I know. I'm glad I know that this is real and that, and that what I have is real. And um, if there's anything about tradition, I mean, even we uh, as Bible apostolics have our traditions and traditions are good. There's nothing wrong with traditions. Uh, but I think sometimes our traditions can be a curse. And, and the way I say that, if I turn your attention to John chapter 6, if you've got your Bible, turn with me to the 6th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I want to uh, bring something out today. Hopefully, prayfully, the Lord will be able to, to help us to understand things. Because I, I think, you know, as he has specifically said to me that he is doing a new thing. And sometimes when we hear the phrase, a new thing, we, we feel that it's going to be something new within the parameters of something old or something new within the parameters that, that we have or that we're holding on to. Let me show you, for example, in, a, in John chapter, uh, Gospel of John ch chapter 7. I think I'm going to go up to verse 48, down to verse 48, however you want to look at it. When I, could, when I think of how the, the world at the time that Jesus stepped on the scene and how that mankind, and this is the beauty of the Word of God, there are so many parallels of, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. The Bible clearly tells us in the New Testament that the Old Testament was written for our example. So there's things that we can learn from how mankind, you know, walked or responded to God under the Old Covenant how God responded to man under the Old Covenant, and then how God responded and how He is responding to mankind in the New Covenant. And the beauty about Scripture is that it's relative to every single culture, every single age, every single year. It's relative to every aspect of mankind's life. For people to say the Bible is not applicable today, and, and when you think of how, how society is trying to destroy the very foundations that our country, for example, was founded upon, mm -hmm. and how they're pointing out, well, you know, we're evil and this is no good, and how they're trying to take what God established in the in the Garden of Eden between a man and, and a woman in the design of having children and raising family, Ephesians chapter five. And, I mean, when when man starts to infiltrate the foundation of God's foundation. The only results, the, the actual response to that is clearly chaos, fracture, destruction. It, it's like you, you ever, there's been times where I've had a piece of thread on, on something and, and in my adult mind, I feel I can just grab this piece of thread and pull it and, and snap it. But boy, there's been times where I was sorry I did that because it didn't break, it just <laughs> kept on unraveling. Uh, then I got to answer to her for doing that. Doing what did you do? <laughs> but uh, you know, interfering with what God has established really is a dangerous place to be. But that's exactly what tradition does. Tradition has a tendency of blocking God out. In tradition, when people are standing on, on solely on tradition, this is how it's been done. This is how it's always going to be done. This is how it's 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 got to be done. And when you, when, you, when you take that type of stand, then God himself cannot show you the new thing that he's trying to do. And if I understand the scripture cor correctly, God always shifted in times and in seasons. God always brought change when mankind least expected it. So for mankind to take the purity of the Old Testament tabernacle plan and, and the the, uh, the sacrifices being done in the outer court and the responsibility of the priest in the holy place and what took place beyond the veil in the holiest of holies 
and totally corrupt that and pollute that and uh, make it less than what God originally intended it to be. Now again, Bible says that was written for our examples. Many of the Old Testament law was, was written to make wrongdoing a legal offense. And so when, we, when Jesus steps on the scene after this period of time where historians and it's been declared that there was 400 years of silence, it wasn't 400 years personally. I don't believe that God didn't have people and God wasn't communicating with his own, but it was 400 years where you don't find anything anything new that was unfolding. And by the time Jesus had stepped on the scene, mankind had taken the purity of a foundational truth of relationship with God and turned it into tradition. Yes. Matter of fact, mankind added their own traditions to it. Yes. Hello? Yes. How many, how many yes. churches, how many religious yes. systems that you know where mankind has infiltrated his ideas or her ideas into the very foundation of where that where that uh, where that particular organization or group uh, originated. You can go back and study church history, and there was times where churches that exist today had the baptism of the Holy Ghost being poured out in their congregations, but they didn't like it. They didn't like the noise it created. They didn't like the chaos. To them, it was it was well, oh, oh, we we can't have this, and so they voted the Holy Ghost out of the church. They did that. Look it up. It's his historical. And so that so you would think that God would say, oh, no, I'm not going to. Uh, God's not going to let that happen. He will let it happen because he has obligated himself to never violate our free will. He will let us do what we want to do. Right. He will let us think we're saved when we're not saved. He, he will let us go our way until such a time when we stand before him and have to account what we've done with what, what he's given to us. He, did he not say in Isaiah that his word would not go forth void. and return mm -hmm. void? void? Yeah. Yeah. It'll always accomplish that which he's designed it to accomplish. And I've got to be open to receive whatever word he wants to give me. And I've got to be open for him to say, okay, it's time to shift. This is a new thing I'm going to do with you. Uh, he's already, as you've heard personally, said that to me. And after he said that, he said, there will be many that won't understand. And, and I, I still try to wrap my mind around that. I say, why? Why won't they understand? But you can go right back to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. And you can read how, how by the time Jesus stepped on the scene, the religious system was so corrupt. The God thing was so corrupt. I mean, it was just, it was shocking, quite frankly, to read about the Old Testament God and then come into the New Testament and see what mankind had done. But that's exactly what Jesus stepped into. And you and I go to and fro throughout our life trying to share with people this thing, this new thing that Jesus has done for us. There's this separation, this, this uh, salvation. You know, the burden that we feel sometimes when we see people that either think they're saved, but we know that doctrinally they don't have a biblical foundation of that salvation. We know what the end result is going to be. That's right. Everybody wants to be prayed for. Everybody wants to live forever. Everybody wants things to go nice. And, and everybody wants to be healed. And everybody, don't, they don't want problems. And, and so when, when the boat seems to be sinking, everybody, most everybody calls upon God and help me, help me, help me. But then once things get back to normal again, God's the furthest thing from their mind. God's not a part of it. I don't know about you, but God is a, an everyday part of my life. Amen. Hello? Amen. I wake up thinking about Him. I walk through the day talking to Him. I lay my head down at night before I sleep talking to Him. Every single aspect of life, we have a relationship with Him. And so Jesus in John 6, He, he, he blew those people away. Even people that profess to be disciples. It's interesting sometimes to see the light come on when, especially with new converts, where you might be teaching them a home Bible study or going through scripture with them. And, and most of us come into this with some type of knowledge of God or things we've heard or maybe this is what our family taught or tradition. And, uh, and then the light comes on when we say, wait a minute. I've never been shown this. I've never been taught this. I never, I never realized that this was for me. And, and they, they, they learn. And the beauty of, of always having a, a hunger and a thirst for the Lord 
and for the things of God is, is such a critical, critical aspect of our relationship and our walk with Him. I mean, you, you see how long you can go without drinking water. See how long you, you would last without getting any type of liquid nourishment inside your body. Your body would start to break down. I think, what are we, 80% water, our body, something to that effect. And it's the same way with, with relationship with God. And it's amazing how Jesus himself used water to uh, reflect the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that if a person would believe in him, like the Bible says, uh, then the scripture says when they apply that belief to their lives and they let it transform them, they let it take, out of their belly would flow rivers of living water. So that, that gives us a key that we need to be praying in the spirit more often than not. We need to be walking in the spirit, allowing that water, that living water just to continually refresh us and I'm, I don't know about you, but I know when I, I start to stray. Hello. Yes. I know when my flesh starts to get the upper hand. How about you? And, and it, you know, like Brother Kevin said, all of a sudden things start creeping up. Like, where in the world did that come from? And But when you're constantly in the flow of, of living water, and there's spirit, and there's word, and there's confirmation, and a desire to know him, and a desire just to... Even he said in the Old Testament, how long are you going to draw water out of that well <laughs> that doesn't satisfy? And that's exactly where our world is today. And if I'm honest, there's even believers that are walking today that are continually drawing from wells, cisterns that really don't have anything that can satisfy, that can bring lasting satisfaction to the point where you don't need anything else but him. So in verse 48 of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, he says, I am that bread of life. He, he taught them, he, he, he began to, to, to teach them where he had come from. Because, I mean, there was, there was all kinds of, of questions about him. You know, is he, is, he, is, he, you know, is he the prophet Elijah that's resurrected? Is, you know, John the Baptist, of course, they thought he was the Messiah. You know, just like today, people, you know, what's this about? What, what, what's this about? And, and, and what is that? You know, sometimes people will go from church to church until they, something clicks when they're there and they find something that they're looking for. And, and I've had that happen. I've had people, I'll never forget one guy, you know, he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and he was a firecracker. It was powerful to hear his testimonies, to listen to him, to, to be with him. We had prayer meetings in our living room and, and the power of God would hit him and he'd, he'd uh, testify or speak in tongues. or It was just a, an awesome, awesome experience. And in a moment time, in an instant time, the adversary came and snatched, out, snatched away what he had and he walked away from it. That's right. Yeah. And he said to me when he walked away, he said, maybe, maybe I'll have to be like Paul. The Apostle Paul, he really wreaked havoc in the church when he first came into the church to the point where they just told him to go home. He, he, was, he was causing all kinds of chaos. So it's believed he, he went and he went to the backside of a desert, if I can say it that way, for a number of years. And, uh, and he eventually got established and eventually turned to be what God had instructed him to be. But... You know, this guy says, you know, maybe I have to be like the Apostle Paul and go away for a season and then end up coming back. But he hasn't come back yet. I pray for him every every now and then. He pops in my mind. That's oh Lord. So Jesus steps on the scene and he says to them, I'm the bread of life, verse 48. And he references, he references their tradition, their history, something that they were familiar with. Verse 49, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Everybody say dead. Dead. And uh, he says, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. <laughs> I don't know about you, but we had a good breakfast yesterday. I did anyway. And uh, for lunch, I started out with a piece of cake and some ice cream and made my way to some steak and rice. And uh, by the time we got home last night, Brother Kevin, my, my stomach was making noise. I needed to eat something. So I had a small bowl of shredded wheat, frosted shredded wheat. Like that. <laughs> and, uh, and when I got up in the morning, could you believe I was hungry again? 
God has created us so that even though we may eat food, eventually we come to a place where, where uh, we do get hungry again. We, our bodies are designed for nourishment. Our bodies are designed to have a continual sustenance. And when he made this statement to them and said that this is the bread which come down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die, it totally caught them off guard because they knew everybody died. They knew everybody, <laughs> if you eat, you'll, you'll be able to function. You'll keep on, keep on going. But then when he turns around in verse four, 51 and he says, I am the living bread. You see, that's the difference between, let's say what we have and what others that are not in the faith have. The difference is living bread. We have something that's alive. The Bible says that the word of God is, is, King James says quick and powerful, but it means it's alive and it's active. Praise God. Thank you. Jesus. And he tells them that this eternal truth is the fact that, that I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This is, the, this is the curse of tradition. God is ready to do a new thing. God comes on the scene, manifests himself as flesh. He, in, the, in Jesus Christ, his ministry is going to begin. And he starts talking about, he's in the synagogue and he's teaching. They've seen his signs and wonders. They've seen his miracles. They've seen the manifestation of what he can do. But as he begins to talk, their traditions literally close the door on what he was trying to impart to them. And you'll see, you'll see this in a minute. And in the hour that we're living in, and, and we've, we've heard it many times, if you have any sense of the Holy Ghost, you can sense what's going on. We, we know, you know, we're in the last of the last days, uh, whether the Lord is going to return while we're all still here, or we're, we're, whether he takes us home before everybody else goes, no man knows the hour nor the day, however, we see that there's been a shift in the atmosphere. There's been a, a change in the environment, if I can say it that way. Not the natural environment, but the spiritual environment. There's a very, very active spirit realm that, that has been stirred up, both on the side of, of our adversary, but also both on the side of God. God. Because God is, uh, if I can use the crazy analogy of a, of a chess player, he is moving his people, the pieces that he is going to use to bring the greatest end time harvest and revival that the world has ever seen. But at the same time, he's going to bring the greatest judgment that mankind has ever seen. He even described it as something that has never happened to the earth at that time. You know that death doesn't, has no respect? No. Nope. Death doesn't wait. He doesn't care about your schedule. Death doesn't care about what you've got planned. Uh, I mean, you can you can have all kinds of things planned out, and when it's time for that appointment, that appointment is going to come. And to know that, but to walk around in life like it doesn't exist and like it's never going to happen. Now, I don't mean we walk around and say, "Oh, I'm going to die someday. I'm going to die someday." Of course, as believers, we know to be absent from the body, we're going to be present with the Lord. I'll stand here and say, "I can't wait to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> come quickly, Lord Jesus." But I don't know. I don't know how my appointment is going to play out. I don't know what his plan is. But he does have a plan for me and he does have a plan for you. And so the atmosphere is primed. You know, if you have gasoline in a particular area, there can be no flame or anything. But you take a, a lighter and stand in that room <laughs> with fumes of gas around, you can... You can really cause some serious, serious damage if you were to light that flame. Oh, Jesus. And this is where we're at. There are things being ignited by mankind into the earth that is bringing what some people are calling a great reset. And this great reset may not affect our everyday living. Yeah, groceries are going up and gasoline is going up and some crazy things as inventory shortages. So we're, we're getting bits and pieces out of it. But there's a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, <clears throat> influx of spirituality that is being both thrown out there by 
witchcraft and seducing spirits and uh, doctrines of devils. It's been around forever, but it's, it's rampant up. We know the scripture says Satan knows he has a short time. He is going to wreak havoc in the church. Trust me, Satan is going to wreak havoc in the church and God is going to let him do it. So much so that there are going to be believers that will die for the faith. I don't know if I'm going to be in that category, Sister Doty. I'm free now. I can say what I want. I can do what I want for the most part. But we really don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And so when Jesus says to these folks that the bread that he gives is his flesh, it totally, totally caught them off guard. It was a new time for a new thing and a new season. And they closed their minds and they used their tradition to criticize what Jesus was trying to tell them. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you and I would not allow the traditions of truth that we have, of Bible that we know, of experiences that we've experienced, you, to Jesus. close the door on the change that Jesus is trying to bring in my life and trying to bring in your life. Because trust me when I say that each and every one of us are going to have to be changed and transformed to walk into an end time event that the Lord has planned for us. And some, some current apostolic believers are going to be challenged to the hundredth degree when he really begins to unfold what he plans on unfolding. Oh, Jesus. And we're going to find out, my friends, if what we say we are and what we say we have, we truly have it and we truly are that. And I believe the, these verses of Scripture, look at verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were so turned off to what Jesus was telling them that they didn't understand. And they didn't want to understand. Kevin, if, if you told me something that you felt God told you and you, and you had Bible and, and, and it was just totally out of my realm, I'd say, man, we got to look at this. Let's study this together. Let's, you know what I mean? I, I don't want to just write something off just because I didn't have the experience or just because I haven't been told that before. And there's people that you and I know that are holding on to traditions. And I'm not saying their traditions are wrong, but they're not in the place to be changed the way God wants to change them right now. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It's always been a process with God to take you from A to B to C to D and take you from... And if, if my tradition or my certain comfort level wants me to stay right where I'm at, because I know if I go any further, maybe it'll mean more commitment. Maybe it'll mean change. For some, it's going to mean that they're going to have to separate themselves from the traditions that they're used to because they feel so comfortable in that realm of tradition. They're accepted in that realm of tradition. They feel comfortable in that realm of tradition. And God is trying to show them, teach them deeper, an understanding of word, a confirmation of spirit. But they, they, well, I'm comfortable where I'm at right now. This feels good where I'm at right now. Don't, don't tell me I've got to change. I don't want to change. And Jesus then says to them in verse 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Talk about it. Talk about a blow. <clears throat> what? I, you telling me I've got to eat your flesh and drink your blood? You see, the curse of tradition stole their teachable spirit, didn't even let them, they were blinded, caused them to be stiff-necked, caused, caused their mental understanding to be totally shut down. And, and he, wasn't, he wasn't doing it to purposely destroy them. He was doing it to see what is inside of these people. Are these people going to receive what I'm trying to say to them? Are these people going to receive what, what I'm trying to do with them? And every one of us will find ourselves 
And maybe even today, you might be in that place too, where God has been trying to show you something deeper, bring you a little further, give you more revelation, give you more understanding. He uses your everyday life and your experience to show you that I want to take you into a further place, a further place of strength, a further place of understanding. I have a purpose for you and I want to use you in my plan as I position my church to be my hands and my feet and my mind and my eyes on the earth. And if you will yield yourself to that, I'm going to use you for my glory. Verse 54, whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. Thank you, Jesus. What? You mean to tell me that I don't have a relationship with God because I haven't eaten his flesh and drank his blood? Does that sound familiar? You mean to tell me because I haven't been baptized in Jesus' name the way you say that I'm not saved or I haven't, I haven't spoken in tongues? You mean I've got to speak in tongues in order to be saved? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, it's ridiculous. You know, If that was true, why doesn't all the Christian world believe in that? He continued in verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me and I live by the Father... So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Remember when the people of his days said, Oh, Abraham was our father. You know, the, you know, tradition. And what did he say to them? If Abraham was your father, you'd be doing what I told you to do. Because before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. What? How could that be? You're, 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 you're just, you're, yeah. you, you, what do you mean? You're not old enough to be. How can you say that? But if I'm not mistaken, Sister Cynthia, the scripture, when he said that, didn't they fall back? Because he said, I am. He manifested himself as the great God of the universe. I am. And that words came out of his mouth and down they went. Praise God. Tradition, the curse of tradition. Verse 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna. He tells them, I'm not talking about natural food. I'm not talking about flesh as you and I see it and have it. I'm not talking about the blood. It's the same blood that's flowing in your body and my body. I'm not talking about something that you're drinking or you're physically eating. But the curse of tradition kept the door shut where they couldn't advance any further. And, and. Verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And let's read verse 60 together. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear? There's been things that Jesus has said to me and, and, and it was hard to receive. Yeah. Especially if my flesh didn't want to do it. Right. <laughs> you know, sometimes God will tell you, the Lord will tell you to do something or say something that will feel so strange. You'll think it's so strange. You'll, 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 you'll convince yourself it is so far-fetched. And you'll begin to want, why in the world is, why would he want me to go say that to her or him? Why would he want me to do That doesn't make any sense to me. But you know what he's doing when he does those things? He wants to see, number one, if you can hear him, and number two, if you're going to obey him. Mm -hmm. right. Because he doesn't care if it doesn't make sense to you. Mm -hmm. It may not make sense to anybody else around you. But for you, it has to make sense in that you hear the voice of God and you obey the voice of God. And when you obey the voice of God and you do what he tells you to do, he then... There may be no manifestation. There, see, we like results. We're result-oriented people. If he tells us to do something and we do it, we want to see something happen. There's got to be something happen. That's how we confirm that, yeah, I heard from God because I said this or I did this and it happened. But in training, in development, in breaking down the walls of tradition, he may do things and not give you an answer. There'll be no manifestation of spirit. There'll be no confirmation or anything. He just wanted to see 
if you're going to do what he told you to do. And as you do it, that develops your hearing ear. That develops that, that, that humbleness. And, and that's how you learn, oh, wow, I, I know how to hear from God. God's talking to me, and I know it's his voice because I've experienced it before. When Jesus himself, verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples, notice, his disciples murmured at it, he said unto him, unto them, does this offend you? You ever have the word of God offend you? Anytime. Be honest with you. Anytime. You ever have the word of God step on your toes? Anytime. Of course, the immediate response is for us to blame the deliverer. Point the finger at the person that's delivering the mail and say, like, how dare him? Who does he think he is? Or who she thinks she is? But Jesus wanted to know. In verse 62, he expounds that question a little deeper and asks, joins another question to it. He says, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend, uh, ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickens. It's the spirit that makes alive is what he's saying. That word quicken means to make alive. It's the spirit that quickens the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. He was driving the fact home. Yes, many disciples ended up walking away. They weren't who they said they were. They labeled themselves as disciples. They labeled themselves as followers of Jesus. But when the rubber hit the road and he began to break through their traditional understanding and their traditional thinking, it revealed truly what they were on the inside. And that is happening now. That is happening now, even in this hour, where believers are being challenged with a new season, a new thing that God is trying to do. God is trying to break through traditional walls. God is trying to break through traditional habits. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves saying, this is a hard saying. I was brought up in this thing and I've never heard of this thing before. And, and, what, 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 and there may be people that you know that won't accept what you have to say because Jesus is sending you into a new season. And, and we, want, we want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We, uh, we, want people to, 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 we want people to love us and accept us. And God, what you're telling me to do, not everybody, many will not understand, but why? And all his response is, is just, just let your faith exceed what your natural eyes see and what your natural ears hear. Verse 64, there's some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except were given him unto him of my father. Do you realize that the only reason why you and I stand in heavenly places here today is because the spirit of the Lord drew us to himself? Amen. That's what he was saying. Nobody comes to God unless the Spirit draws. And the Spirit will draw in many ways, shape, or forms. The results will always, the end results will always be the same. But God will take somebody out of this structure. God will take somebody out of that structure. God will take somebody out. And there's people, that loved ones, there's people we love, there's people we, we know that God wants to take them out of that darkness that he called and bring them into his marvelous light. But they don't understand. And they blame us. They look at us. Oh, you think you are holier than thou? You think you're the only one that has the answers and yada, 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 yada. And they don't understand that their tradition and their lack of understanding is the very thing that is closing the door of opportunity for the Lord Jesus Christ to reach into their lives. And so we weep, Brother Mike uh, Krupka. We, we pray, oh Lord, somehow... Turn them from darkness to light. Translate them from that darkness as he instructed Paul in Acts 26 and 18 to pray. Turn them from darkness to light. Transform them. Translate them, Father. Jesus. From the beginning, from that time, many. Everybody say many. Verse 66. Notice, from that 
Time is in italics. It wasn't in the original translation. So you could read 66 as from that, from that statement that he, that he made. As a matter of fact, in the Passion Translation, it says, and so from that time on, many of the disciples turned their backs on Jesus and refused to be associated with him. Oh, you're one of those Jesus only people, huh? Yes, sir. Yep. You don't believe in a Trinity? No. no. It's not biblical. Then if that's true, why are there so why do the majority of the Christian faith believe in a Trinity if that was a so you don't know what you're talking about? Oh, Jesus. Hello? Jesus said to the 12 in verse 67. Can you imagine this? Can you? They're, they're hearing all of this going on and all of the discourse. And he looks at the closest ones to him. And he asks that question. Will you also go away? But Lord, I, I've been in this for 40 years. Why would you ask me that? Because I'm about to change some things. And I want to make sure that you're on board because it's not going to be familiar to it. Matter of fact, I'm stripping you of your traditions. What? I thought I knew how to pray. I, I, I thought I knew how to hear from God. I, I, I thought I knew, gee, I mean, I'm engaged with other people. We pray together. We'd... Simon turns around in verse 68 and he answers him. <laughs> This is where we need to be, folks, in this verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, what does he say? Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Stand with me if you would this afternoon. Peter spoke up and said, but Lord, where would we go? No one but you gives us the revelation of eternal life. We're fully convinced that you are the anointed one, the son of the living God, and we believe in you. That's the, the Passion Translation. Peter's profession of faith, a confession of faith, needs to be something that you and I keep under lock and key. There's only one way to be saved. And that's the message of Acts 2.38. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for everybody. There's only one God. And his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus was the express image of the invisible God. The only person of God we're going to see and have seen is in the body of Jesus Christ. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There's biblical truth that he's revealed to you and I as Bible apostolics. And there's so much more he wants to reveal to us. The gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are going to be so active in this last day's church. And he wants each and every one of us to be engaged in the gifts of the Spirit. He wants every one of us transformed by the fruit of the Spirit. He wants every one of us to understand the authority he's given us. The dominion he's given us. We hear so much word. We hear so much teaching. If you're plugged into any of this, you, you can sense it. You can feel it. And, and it's, it's like, wow, we're right at the edge, Lord. Or I, like I said, oh, man, I, you know us, Lord. We want it now. We want it to happen now. And, and just say, let me wait on you. Let me be strengthened. Let me, however he wants to develop you. I don't know how he's developing you. I know how he's developing me. But I pray in Jesus' name that your tradition, your Pentecostal, Bible-believing, Acts 2.38 tradition doesn't close the door to him, to what he wants to, where he wants you to move and where he wants to bring you to that place where you're prepared for his end time plan. Jesus. Jesus. After he tells them, or Peter responded to him, Jesus shocks them with these words in verse 70. 
I have handpicked you to be my 12, knowing that one of you is a devil. That's right. Oh, yeah. Talk about a traditional blow. Nobody picks somebody that they know is a devil. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. And I've met some devils in my day. <laughs> Understand what he's saying. I'll read it to you in the Passion. Jesus shocks them with these words. I have handpicked you to be my to be my twelve, knowing that one of you is a devil. Jesus was referring to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, for he knew that Judas, one of his chosen disciples, was getting ready to betray him. You see, he knows. He knows all about us. He knows everything about us. He knows how we think. He knows. He knows. He knows. Never let your weakness destroy what he's trying to show you. Never deny something he shows you, he points out to you. Never just assume I'm okay and everything is the way it is. This is the normalcy of my life. No, there's no such thing as the normalcy when you walk with him. He's a constant changing God. Yes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When it comes to plan, when it comes to purpose, when it comes to his structure, when it comes to what he's ordained from the foundations of the world, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever as far as that goes. But every culture needs people, his people need to adjust. Every situation, there needs to be adjustment. It, it can be fine today, and in a moment's time, it'll turn on you. And you've got to be ready to turn. You've got to be ready to go with the flow. If you're being led of the Spirit, it'll be an easy transition because you know He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll be with you. He'll empower you. He'll give you inspiration. He'll give you wisdom. It's all laid out in the book for us. And you and I have the privilege of walking with Him in this hour. Not just so we feel good and feel appreciative, but so that we can be part of what he's doing in the last of the last days. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? Just talk to him for a moment. How's the Holy Ghost been talking to you today? In Jesus' name, Father. I am blind and I cannot see. Unless you give me revelation, unless you impart to me wisdom, I pray in Jesus' name that your word, Father, today would speak to my heart. Your word, Father, today would bring me to a place of understanding. It is your strength in my inner man that I so desperately depend on, Jesus. It is your presence. It is your word. It is everything, Father, that you're doing, that you're instructing, that you're showing. I pray each and every one of us would have ears to hear, eyes to see, Father. What kind of transformational change would take place if he would unstop our ears to hear the cry of the human souls around us? We want to be your conduits, Father. We want to know. We want to understand, Father. Give us what we can, Jesus. Teach us. Train us, Lord. I pray we find ourselves at your feet, learning of you more and more and more as these last days unfold. And I believe, Father, there are others that you're going to join to this congregation. There are others, my God, that right now they're questioning and wondering and looking and searching and they're thirsty and they're hungry and they're looking for deliverance, Father. And I believe you're going to touch them. I believe there's going to be such an outpouring of your spirit, Father. And I want to be smack in the middle of what you're doing, Lord Jesus. Whatever it takes, my God, if you have to try the reins, if you have to search us, oh God, I pray. Do whatever you've got to do, Lord Jesus, to allow us to be a part of these end time events as they unfold. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes, my God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So able.